good afternoon, a uh, good evening, a uh, good morning uh, from wherever uh, you're joining us from. Welcome uh, to this uh, Internews Earth Journalism webinar. Uh, and it did a very uh, unique a webinar uh, that we're calling the politics uh, of climate change and how you as a journalist uh, can scrutinize and talk about uh, the green agendas uh, of the political candidates who are running um, this year. Uh, but I want to put a disclaimer uh, that it's not really about you know politics. Uh, we really want to, uh, to take this opportunity to talk about climate change and our country, our continent and our world and what uh, we are experiencing today and, and also you know, start a conversation about what can be done, uh, not only by the government or by our leaders, but by every individual and as a, a journalist, uh, as yourself. Uh, so in as much as we have uh, political aspirants, uh, this would be a start of a conversation uh, because when we talk about climate change, uh, it's a story that has so many elements. It has politics in it, it has business, it has poverty, and gender. So we hope that from our distinguished uh, panelists, uh, we are able uh, to start uh, this narrative and see where we'll take it you know, forward. Um, again, thank you so much uh, to uh, our webinar uh, at Internews Arts Journalism Network. As we wait uh, for more people to join us, uh, most of you are probably aware about Internews, a media development organization that's committed to improving you know uh, journalism uh, everywhere in the world uh, by giving uh, reporters the, the skills and knowledge uh, they need uh, to be able to tell their stories better uh, stories on hum uh, hum humanitarian issues stories on health and uh, for internews at uh, journalism program uh, this is the environment arm of internews uh, so to speak uh, where we operate in over 100 countries, training and building capacity of individual journalists uh, by workshops and webinars uh, like this one, and also giving you uh, story cards uh, so that you're able to go and report uh, on those stories that you otherwise would not be able to report on. And also we started uh, in East Africa at uh, this project in 2019, uh, we just got an extension uh, for one more year uh, to do this work we're doing uh, in Africa. Uh, we're super happy and grateful to our funders, uh, USAID, United States uh, International Aid Development, as well as a Department of Interior and other partners that we work with uh, across East Africa in Kenya, Uganda, uh, Tanzania, and Rwanda. So we've been able to train and issued story grants to you know over 100 uh, reporters uh, in the past three years and mostly we've been working on wildlife and conservation issues and uh, this year we started a bit of climate change and that's why we're doing this webinar but uh, early this year a workshop on the same uh, currently we have nine uh, reporters uh, from kenya uh, on the field uh, t telling stories about you know uh, 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 climate change. And uh, you, you, you're welcome uh, to see more of opportunities on Earth Journalism and Network, where we'll upload uh, this webinar uh, recording immediately uh, it's done. Uh, so uh, I'd like you uh, to note a few housekeeping rules, uh, really. If you look at your bottom of the screen, you will find we have a QA and um, icon as well as the chat. Uh, please we encourage you to ask questions and be specific uh, to each speaker uh, depending on what they present and the question that you'd like to ask. Can you go to Q&A and, and put your question there, tell us where you are from, the country and your names and also ask your question to a specific um, you know, a speaker. So we'll do this at the tail end uh, of the, the tail end of the webinar. Uh, also, you'll be on mute uh, and all video, but you'll be able to see our speakers and we share a resource email after this with all their presentations and their contacts so that you can reach them 
at a time you know uh, that you uh, that, you know that, that you like to ask any question that has been not answered here live uh, so uh, i think i'll bring our you know uh, first speaker and we're hoping to, to get more people there been a lot of interest uh, with this webinar of 150 uh, people uh, registered so we're hoping to have a good number and uh, so we'll be having presentations for about 15 minutes uh, with our four speakers and then from there we'll uh, we'll have uh, the Q&A so please start asking your questions uh, immediately and we we'll put them to uh, to each of the speakers according to uh, to the one that you ask the questions uh, so without uh, wasting much time I would like to bring in our first uh, speaker who is our colleague uh, Joyce Chibi and she'll be talking about her perspective uh, reporting on science and health, environment, and most importantly, uh, on climate change. And she tell us uh, the projects she's been doing uh, this year uh, with, uh, with, uh, with elections and interviewing a lot of candidates and what she thinks, uh, how we can learn from her uh, on her experiences and, uh, and also to, you know, to steal her thoughts, what she thinks about these uh, important uh, projects, uh, which she tells, she tells me is more it's more about life and why all of us should care and why we should move from telling problem stories to solutions. Miss um, Joyce Chimbi, uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Kyundu, um, for that introduction, and I'll, I'll jump right into it. So mine is to give a journalist perspective on issues politics uh, for climate change. So I'd just like to give a brief uh, background on where we started as journalists. Um, the past, um, we've, we've had a disconnect between interrogating um, the green agenda from a political perspective, because every time we've spoken to politics, politicians in the past, it's been from a perspective of us wanting them to give their views about climate change as a natural um, disaster. For example, when we've had floods, when we've had uh, landslides, drought, those are the moments when we look for political leaders. So that disconnect has affected the way, as journalists, we, we tell stories. So if we, Kenyans, we know very well about one of our key champions, the late Professor Wangari Madai, and she was always uh, in collision with the, with the government of the day because her green agenda was not seen to fit into the into into the politics of the day and it's not only just recently when we started enjoying some of the benefits of the of the green spaces that she fought for so as moving from that um from that perspective of only looking for politicians when these are with when, when there's a natural disaster or when these are contentious issue for example if we can remember every time we interviewed Professor Angari Madai, it was from a point of the government is doing this to you, there's resistance about some of the uh, interventions you want to do on climate change. So moving from that perspective of a man bites dog in reporting the green agenda to a perspective of us looking at climate issues as a pressing issue that the media need to, to, to focus on and the media needs to be, to be centered on, has been a journey. And um, I think that history is very, very important because it's helped us understand that the world has moved on. We've moved on from looking at climate issues as, as contentious to looking at climate issues as, as a most pressing issue that, and, and everybody must play a part in, uh, in, in mitigating effects of, uh, of climate change. So the, the, the current climate uh, reporting environment has many opportunities for, for climate reporting. So when you're talking about uh, political leadership within the context of uh, the Green Agenda, there are many opportunities, yes, but uh, uh, journalists also face many challenges. And one of the challenges is identifying uh, political leaders who can speak to these issues. This is a very, very heated um, political environment for us Kenyans, because we are going into a very, very major general elections in August and 9th. And in the run up to that election, if you look at uh, the politics of the day, climate is not a top priority. In fact, unless you ask a political leader about uh, the green agenda, you will not hear issues climate being discussed 
within the political fora. So, because in a sense, uh, politicians don't consider cl climate issues as a long hang hanging fruit. These are not things they feel the electorate or the voters want to hear about, which is a contradiction because most of the issues that we are facing today, be it uh, uh, challenges of food security, even the inflation that we are facing now, all have to do with a lack of or an absence of uh, a mainstreaming of the of the green agenda in our politics and across all our, all the sectors of our economy. And um, as journalists, I think our work our work is cut out for us because there's no reason why our, any political leader, be it an MCA, be it an MP or a senator or a governor, there's no reason why they shouldn't be talking about political. I mean, uh, the green agenda. Whether these leaders are in the assault region or in the coastal region. Because when you look at the coastal region, the issue of the blue economy is here with us. And Kenya is blessed with so many natural resources. So we cannot escape the green, the green agenda. So as journalists, one of the things that, I've, that I have learned, because um, as Kendo mentioned, I've been doing a project on uh, profiling women leaders. And uh, by women, women leaders, I mean women who will be vying for various political positions come August. And I have discovered something interesting that there are so many leaders who are passionate about the green agenda. It's just that they're not deliberate and they're not intentional about speaking to these issues because they're not considered issues that people want to hear about. People want to hear about, we, we are going to give you jobs, we are going to do this for you, we're going to do uh, that for you. But the climate or the green agenda is about all of us. Even as journalists, we have a role to play. If you look at how the women agenda has become such a defining moment for our politics today, that is the journey that the green agenda must travel. And for the green, for the green agenda to get to where the women agenda has gotten within the political spaces, we must play a very, very big role. So while interviewing these uh, uh, women, uh, my focus was really on, on women leaders. I discovered that so many of them have modeled their agenda on the, on the green agenda, on the green economy. It's just that they're not speaking about these issues because they don't feel that these issues sell, not just with the electorate, but also with the media. So the media is usually interested in the green agenda when something has happened. Say people are starving, people don't have food. So some of the images we have from uh, Northern, Northern Kenya, it's usually, or people are starving and those, those images so. But uh, in keeping with where the world is moving when it comes to, to the green agenda, I think we must step up. And by doing so, uh, we must also look at uh, the political environment and some of the interesting things that, that have been happening. For many, many years, we only had one political party that was aligned to the, to the green agenda. And that was the Mazingira Green Party on which Professor Madai first vied. But today we have newer parties that are modeled along the green agenda. We have the Green Congress Party, we have the Green Thinking Action Party. And one of the contestants on the Green Think, uh, Thinking Action Party is a very, very young environmentalist called Anita Soina, and she's vying for the Kajiado North uh, Member of Parliament seat. Um, some of the other things that have happened and um, fronted by political leaders and more so uh, um, the Higa governor, um, Dr. Wilberforce Sotichilo, was, the, was last year in 2021 when we had the first subnational climate conference in Makueni. Um, it was quite telling how we take opportunities on green agenda when they present themselves to us. So I noticed that uh, many of my colleagues who were present at the conference did not wade into the, the, the climate agenda or the green agenda. They were more interested in the politics of the day. So here you have a low hanging fruit of uh, political leaders converging because there were governors from all 47 counties and, uh, and also uh, climate change experts, uh, climate change experts, green agenda experts. And we were more interested in who was going for what, who was aligning themselves to which political coalition. So there are so many opportunities and yet we tend not to see them. And the reason why it's because we've also bought into this agenda that uh, climate does not sell, and it does. Um, I think for me, what I've realized is, because when I started writing on climate change, that was eight years ago. And it was around the same time when I first met uh, the Bihiga governor, uh, Dr. Otichilo, we, uh, together with the late uh, governor, Joyce, Dr. Joyce Laboso. And it was not even within the country, it was outside the country. And the person who asked me to speak to them 
Um, it's a person who had sponsored me to attend that conference. It was a world conference on uh, on leg leg legislators or political leaders who are uh, who find the green agenda to be a passion topic and uh, and uh, and an issue that should be mainstreamed within their political agenda. So what I've realized since is that. You're not going to, it's not every day when you're going to meet uh, these political leaders who are talking about climate change, but there are so many of them who have this um, at the center of their manifesto, but you have to call, call politicians. By that I mean, if for example, you're based in Makoeni, and uh, right now we are, we are, we are suffering from uh, low rainfall, and we expect there's going to be low productivity. So you can call any MCA who is vying or any MCA who is the, the incumbent also and ask them, what, what, what does your manifesto say about uh, mitigating effects of, cl of climate change? What does your manifesto say about uh, extracting natural resources within our, our counties? And what does your manifesto say about tapping into the green agenda? Because that's where the world is moving and we must move with it. And I've realized that don't look for political leaders when there's a problem. On a random day, and don't, don't always just focus on, on problems. Do your research. If you're interested in the blue economy, for example, read and become as knowledgeable on that issue as possible. Because sometimes what happens is that you find yourself in spaces where political leaders can speak on the green agenda, but you're not prepared. So you ask them one question and they can gauge they can tell that uh, you have no clue about what you're talking about. And that's the worst thing that can happen to you because most of these political leaders who are interested in issues climate are very, very, very serious about the issue. And they're not interested in pedestrian issues. They want to talk to somebody who is really, really grounded on these issues. So many of the times when you call political leaders, they will not answer because they don't know who is calling and um, they don't want to be bothered sometimes. So you can just send a direct message and also send the same message on WhatsApp. And it's just a short message. I'm a journalist, I'm interested in the green agenda or I'm interested in the blue economy or I'm interested in asal issues and uh, the green agenda. And I can assure you 80% of the time, you're going to get a response. And uh, I realized to navigate the challenges of the gatekeepers, because they all have their peers and they insist, and sometimes the peers will insist that uh, you go through them. For me, I prefer to just go directly because what's the worst that, that's going to happen? They're going to ignore you or they're going to respond to you. So just ask direct questions, do your research, know what you're talking about, because climate is not a one hit wonder kind of story. It's a journey that you have to travel. When I first spoke to Dr. Otichilo, I wasn't very grounded, but uh, he was very gracious and he gave me a very, very good story together with the late governor. They gave me a very, very good story, but I knew if I was to remain on track, I must read, I must join online courses. Most of them are free. And webinars such as this, listen to experts, do your own research, also, I find it helpful. For me, I, mean, I prefer to have a notebook where I put down points. If I'm reading about a topic and I just highlight areas where I need to emphasize, because at times you can reach for a politician, he's not available. But then when you've moved on and you're doing your own things, they call you and they say, and it has happened to me. I've even taken interviews by the roadside because you can't tell them I'm not in a position to speak right now. This is an opportunity that has presented themselves. You need to hear their perspective on this particular issue. So you'll take your, your, your interview whenever the opportunity presents itself. So let's move away from uh, looking at the green agenda from a natural disaster uh, uh, perspective to looking for pract practical and uh, replicable solutions. Recently, I spoke to the MP for Maragua, Mary Wamaua Njoroge. She may not have modeled her political campaign on the green agenda, but she's doing a lot on the ground on issues, climate change. She has water projects going on. She has um, uh, projects with farmers on issues to do with even certified seed, for example, because the kind of climate under which we are doing our agriculture requires us to move away from recycling seeds, for example, into um, satisfied, certified seed. So this, 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 there are so many topics that uh, we could explore, even with politicians, because I feel, as I said, um, there's no reason why any political leader vying for any po uh, uh, position should, 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 should um, relegate climate issues to um, climate experts, because if you're representing people in a constituency, I'm sure they are facing um, the, the fallout 
from the from the uh, severe effects of climate change that are ongoing right now. So there's an urgent need for increased coverage of political leaders as subject and expert sources for climate stories. There's also a need to normalize the convergence between politics, green economy, and sustainable development. Because the green economy is not an end in itself. We are looking at all these sustainable goals. And these goals are heavily dependent on how we interact with our environment. So the missing link in the green agenda remains within the legislative arm. And not because we don't have political leaders who are passionate about these issues. It's because we've also, as journalists, uh, advanced this perspective that this is not a story that sells to editors and also to our readers. And yet, they are the ones who are, uh, are suffering from effects of, uh, of climate change. So I don't think there's any farmer who, would want, who wouldn't want to hear what their political leader has to say about some of the cha challenges that they're facing today. So every leader at the county and national level should have a plan of how to propel their area through climate smart thinking, particularly on issues, uh, blue economy. So, and it is our job to tell these stories. It is our job to pick our phone and persist. It's, uh, you know, politicians looking for them. You are not going to call him once and, or, or she and, and the answer. It's, it's something you have to keep doing. And um, the benefit of uh, when you make a big breakthrough and they realize that you know what you're talking about, anytime you send them a message that you're interested in, a, in, a, in their view about something, they'll even record themselves and send you a WhatsApp. I've had those kind of experiences where somebody has sent me a WhatsApp note or somebody has sent me uh, a, a written response on email. So there is opportunities for us to explore this agenda. And there are increasingly many political leaders who are modeling their political agenda on, the, on, on climate change issues, on the green economy, on the blue economy. So it is up to us to interrogate these issues. Thank you very much. I think that's what I have to say. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'm on hand to respond to them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joyce, uh, for your uh, presentation and uh, speaking on journalist uh, perspective and also uh, showing us the, you know, like the alternative parties we have there. Uh, I know we'll come to uh, the Q&A, uh, but, but there is that interesting uh, comment uh, there from Victor Muturi on that question about that we don't have, you know, uh, manifestos. Uh, you know, talking about the green agenda or talking about climate change. And I know this will come out uh, from, you know, our other speakers and then we'll be able to address it uh, later. And I'm so happy uh, that we have someone uh, from uh, the government, the county government of Nairobi, uh, the climate change, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, director, uh, Maurice uh, Kavai. We'll be hearing from him, uh, you know, as the last speaker. Uh, so that is good to hear about, you know, what um, that those in leadership uh, already are doing as we wait to also see what um, the new aspirants, uh, you know, have to bring uh, on board. Uh, before I introduce uh, Dr. Frida Karani, can I ask you if your audio is now working? Uh, we had a technical problem uh, before. Dr. Karani, if you could say hi. Hi. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear now. Uh, how about Thank your video? You. Yeah, I'd like to bring you in now. Hi. Oh yeah, there you go. Good to see you. Um, Good to see uh, so you. So yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, Dr. Frida Karani uh, is a university lecturer, an advocate of human rights, uh, behavior change, and sustainable community development. And she's the founder of Sustainable Climate Action in Africa Conference. Uh, and she's also an aspirant uh, for the senatorial seat. Uh, she told me she wants to talk uh, a lot about you know, politics, uh, but she will tell us uh, why she wants to, to buy and why she's buying on the green agenda. And her, her topic today is titled be constructing climate politics for the 21st century. The nexus between reality and ideality. That's a very important topic. Uh, Dr. Frida Karan, we're looking forward to, to getting wisdom from you. And the floor is yours. 
can I share your you, screen, uh, your presentation? Or? Yes, 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 please awesome. share. Okay. Let me know when you when it's online. Is that it? Or, uh... Yep, that's it. Uh, possibly we could have it on um, mm -hmm. on uh, presentation mode, but that's just it. So good go. evening. Yeah. Uh, members, participants, and my fellow panelists and our very good organizers who put this together for us. And um, I think uh, where we've reached in terms of climate change and what we need to do to address it, uh, we can no longer talk about the future. We can no longer talk about uh, it's not yet time or this is the good time. Really, what we do about climate has to be our lifestyle. So today um, I have the privilege of talking uh, in this forum just to share uh, what I have experienced, what I have done, what I've seen working, what I've seen not working, and just to propose and discuss um, the way forward in terms of addressing what uh, we need to do so that climate is able to, to really work for us. Because one thing that you realize about climate is that we've gotten where we are over time. It's not that we woke up one morning and we found ourselves in this situation. So let's go to the next slide, please. So my discussion is titled Deconstructing Climate uh, Politics for the 21st Century. Uh, that is the nexus between ideality and reality. And I think one of the most important things that we need to do is to understand where are we getting these concepts and why are we using these concepts? First, why we need to deconstruct is we need to break down the subject of climate. We need to break down climate change and we need to, uh, to break down every term that is out there on climate. Because when you look at those terminologies that are there, they are big term terminologies compared to where we want the action to be. So when you talk about climate justice, when you talk about climate journalism, which is what we are looking at today, we really need to break down this concept of climate change and climate action to very little and tiny bits so that when we go to where the action needs to be felt, which we are going to see at the end of this presentation, then we are really on the same level with these people. And of course, I talked about the 21st century because um, we need to have a context for everything. What are we working with? Where did climate change come from? Is it a 21st century phenomena or is it a, a 19th century phenomena that we need to address now? And then of course we need to look at reality versus ideal, ideality. Reality is what are we working with right now? And ideality is what really should work uh, for the human race. Ideality in this context is not really what we think should be. It is really what should work as far as um, the context of climate change, climate politics, climate action, and journalism for the, for the purposes of this um, conference uh, is concerned. Let's go to the next slide. Let's go to the next one. Now, this is the context that I was trying to create. Um, when the uh, previous slide, please, the, the context, There you go. Uh, yes, that one. So when you're talking about the context of climate politics and journalism, which is really the, st the story behind our, our, our uh, web conference today, we are talking about the third millennium. And as you know, that a millennium is a thousand years. And we have 2000 to, th to the year 3000 to work on these climate issues. And we are only 22 years, 22, 21 years gone into the millennia. So are we really working with what we're expecting to work for us in this um, third millennia? For the 21st century, you know, there's this whole um, wave of the 21st century being a techno century, uh, being a century for the millennials and the like. And we have 2000 
to 2,100 uh, years to work on this context. Then of course, we have the sustainable development goals and the goal number 13 on climate action is a very strong goal because again, it anchors on all the other 16 goals. And what we want to discuss today and agree is by asking ourselves, is the matter of climate action important in ending poverty? Is it important in ending hunger? Is it important in gender equality? You know, that whole context of the sustainable development goals. So we are really trying to say that we are not talking about climate without a context. We are not talking about something that is abstract. We must bring an order into this climate space that we are trying to, to talk about and get everybody to understand. Next slide, please. Yes, the situation analysis is really just um, what are we working with in Kenya? And um, just like our topic suggests that we are looking into politics and, um, and climate issues, and we need to appreciate that this is an electioning year in Kenya. And when it is that period, a lot of things happen. There's a lot of campaigning. There's a lot of talk about the issues that really affect uh, society. But from uh, our first presenter, uh, Madam Chimbi, you realize that where the matters are supposed to be discussed are not being discussed. So we are asking ourselves today, and we want to get an answer or a way forward. What does electioneering mean as far as climate issues are, are concerned? And then also there's a lot of efforts by Kenyans uh, and the Kenyan government to address climate change. We have a lot of work um, that have been designed. We have a lot of uh, working groups that have been put in place. We have national task forces. We have um, county level actions that have been put in place to address climate change. So that is where we are. But of course, what we want to ask ourselves is that, are we, are we getting it? Are we hitting it? Are we missing it? And who needs to come on board? And how strongly do they need to come on board? Then of course, we are also in a situation where there's a lot of mitigation and adaptation measures being discussed at the academia level. We are having research papers being generated. We are having conferences being generated. There's a lot of proposals, a lot of recommendations. Some are very prescriptive, some are very subscriptive, but we need to really appreciate that these issues are already on the table and they are being discussed, but there's just something that we are not getting. And we are hoping that by the end of this presentation, then we will be able to move from this situation we are in to a next level where we need to go now discussing different issues as far as climate change is concerned. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the reality. This is what is on the table for us as far as climate change is concerned. And this is very general. It, it could be in the context of Kenya, but we also need to put Kenya in the context of the continent and globally. So one thing that we need to appreciate is that it's a reality. Climate change is already here and is here with us to stay. I want to take us back for those of you who might be my age. Uh, I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm just around the forties there. I remember um, when I was in primary school, I used to be taught about the ozone layer. And my teacher used to tell me, don't burn garbage because you're destroying the ozone layer. So climate change is already here. Climate change is a status, it's, it's no longer a process. It's here, it's affecting us and it's part of us. Reality number two is that all the efforts that seem to be put in place are still not making the ends meet. We are still not seeing the results of everything that is being done. We still have discussions in the boardrooms. We still have frameworks and policies and acts still on the shelves. We still have so much that is not done. We still have a lot of what I would call pedestrian talk about climate change. Because one of the things that I prescribe to is that when you discuss climate change and after any discussion, no matter how level, uh, no matter how high level, 
and there is no action, then that is just pedestrian dialogue. It's just like we just meet on the street and we discuss climate change and that is it. So we, want, we need to appreciate that the efforts that are being put in place are still not yielding the results that we expect. Then we also need to realize the reality that we are working with is that there's a lot of concentration on science. There's a lot of talking about carbon, carbon emission, net zero. There's a lot of big climate terminologies out there that are being used and it is not um, working for us. We've talked about boardroom discussions and the shelf policies and frameworks. Then we are also having an emerging issue of engendering climate change, trying to say or giving the gender perspective to climate. And for me, I'm thinking, well, this is the reality. It may not necessarily work for us because climate affects everyone. And this concept of um, um, gender, we need to be very careful how we bring it on board as a key factor in climate change, because most of the literature says that climate change affects women more than it affects men. But then, of course, the question that comes on the table is why and how? If you're talking about water and climate or the blue economy and climate, men are there, women are there. So the reality is that there is a, there is a tendency to engender climate change so much and make it inclined on the side of women. Then there's also climate concerns that are being crowded by other political agenda and national frameworks. And I want to give an example here. If you look at where issues of climate change are discussed as a unit, it's very hard to come across that. Either um, climate issues are hidden in an environment ministry or a food security department somewhere, but the issue of climate change is really not coming out as a key issue. When you even come to, the, to, to journalism, which we are talking about today, and the media, climate change is discussed somewhere under the environment issues. When we are talking to our political leaders, which is also a point of discussion today, um, when we ask them about the environment, we expect them to touch on the issue of climate change. But we are not really getting that which we want to get as far as climate change is concerned, because that issue of climate is crowded and hidden in some other um, agendas. If you look at the international uh, frameworks that have been established and, and, and uh, international structures like the IPCC, the way they are structured is that they are able to address climate at their level, but when it comes down um, to, the, to the LDCs and the developing countries, then they become they become mangled up or stuck somewhere with other issues that they lose their meaning, so to say. And um, then we also have the um, other reality that is with us, that there is this narrative of speak the people's language syndrome. That's what I like to call it. Because like um, our first presenter was saying, when you talk to the politicians about climate change, um, somebody will ask you, for me, that is not the issue. My people are dying of hunger. Um, the school going to have school fees. Um, uh, 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 the hospitals are not working. They will give all manner of agendas. I'll bring roads, but they are saying that we need to 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 speak the language that people understand because their focus becomes the vote to get the win and not the real issue that is affecting the people's life. And that's why we said at the beginning, SDG number thirteen on climate action is an SDG that has the possibility of impacting all the other goals. So that if we are talking about um, poverty and education, we need to realize that climate change is affecting our, uh, our agricultural productivity. And that's why we are not able to have enough income to take our children to schools, to afford healthcare and all those other um, issues. The other reality that needs to sink in is that politicians and media have the widest reach of people and people have an informational burden. And what I want to say here is because our context is politics and politicians, and, and I'm speaking from both perspectives, I'm an aspirant yet, and um, I'm also into climate change. What is happening is that if the media and the politicians come together and decide this is the impact we want to have, they will achieve it. Because journalists and the media have the widest reach of people, whatever mediums they use. When the politicians are looking for the votes, there is no corner of their ward or constituency or county. They don't get to ask me. My county, um, which is Embu County, has approximately 330 
thousand voters. And I can assure you, those that have seen my face is well above 75% of that number. So if politicians want and own it up, they can sell the climate agenda to the people by making it their own agenda. But of course, we are going to come in and see what is the challenge they're facing and how we can propose to address it. And then, of course, when you talk about the informational burden, is that there's so much talk about climate everywhere, climate, climate, climate. So many things. Like, for example, when you look at some of the activities that are proposed, Citizen. Look, look at yourself as a citizen of Kenya and the many things you're being told to do to combat climate change. You're being told use renewable energy, you're being told use energy efficient plants, you're being told plant a tree, you're being told check the tires you're using for your vehicle, for your, you're being told use a green car, you're being told, I mean, how much can one simple human mind take. So there is really an information burden and is a reality that we need to work with when we are discussing this climate um, agenda. Next slide, please. Now, ideality. What really must work for us or what is good for us and the best way to do it is very simple. What is like saying, what we are really not getting is more than what we should be getting. And the first ideal situation is that everyone should understand climate change. We may not call it climate change to the 70, 60 year old um, uh, uh, grandma in the village, but somebody needs to understand climate change at their level, be it a high level actor, be it a national actor, an international actor, county level, grassroots, community groups, women, youth, everybody should be able to own by understanding what climate change is. We also need to, um, to, to live in a world where everybody takes responsibility. Everybody should know what am I doing to combat climate change? And we are at a level where we are saying climate change can no longer be combated. Now we have to adapt or mitigate. And you see all these are terms to make climate change a normal part of life. But from where I sit is anything that harms the humankind cannot be taken as a normal part of life. We need to do something uh, about climate change and everybody needs to take responsibility. Because you will go to that politician and ask them, what are you doing? Like our first presenter said is that um, even the politicians know Know these, um, know these spaces, they understand these concepts. And so they'll ask you, before you ask me what I'm doing, what have you done at your small level? Because it is clear, everybody can do something small. When you plant that single tree, that is good enough. Although from where I sit, I don't like the issue of climate action or the issue of climate being simplified as simply plant a tree. You can plant a tree, but continue producing carbon. So what are we doing? You can plant a tree in, um, in, in South Sea, but we have all the industries and all the machineries run, running in the town center. And you know, the effect of climate is it can be spiral. You know, the activity could be many kilometers away, but the effects are being felt that far. And then we also need to have a collective approach where everybody's on board. And lastly, we need to have consolidated information on climate change and action. Let not everybody come and they're discussing climate change in their own language, in their own ways. This information need, need to be consolidated so that it can be delivered to the people. And by the end of today, we are going to be seeing and to be proposing how this can be achieved. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I just thought it's important we understand who are the stakeholders in climate, um, just an overview. And of course, in any discussion in the society, you need to start from the lowest level. Um, before we even get to the very high level uh, discussions, everybody comes from a family, everybody comes from, uh, from a household. So what are households doing? I don't want to, to, to deliberate on this so much because I, I, need, I need us to really concentrate on what the matter is. But as we move forward into our uh, next last three slides, we need to, to see how all these people come on board. Yes, we, have, we are talking about journal, journalists, and we are talking about um, their role in, uh, in the politics of climate, but 
they cannot do it on their own. They need to reach out to the families and the households. They need to reach out to the education institutions. The age at which any person undergoes um, uh, any, uh, primary education, uh, roughly between three years and 18 years, should really be the time when climate actions are concentrated. If you take a class eight people or a form four, uh, form three student, and they're doing something about climate and amplify it on media, you have instilled a sense of confidence and a sense of pride in that young mind and that young, young person that they'll carry all their life. So then we are talking about also government needs to be in place because it is, of course, the executive organ of everything that we discuss. We have workplaces. I like talking about workplaces when I'm talking about climate because um, the people who are in the work spaces right now, are the people who are roughly between 18, 18 years when somebody is an adult or, or roughly 24 years after graduation from college and 60 years, which is, which is the average age of retirement in Kenya. So that group that is ever stuck in the workplace and they spend most of their time at the workplace, what can they do as far as the subject we are discussing is concerned and how can their employers and the people who are in charge of them come and take over? And um, then, of course, we have the economic systems. This is where the industries are, the generators of carbon, the people who are doing all the CSRs, trying to convince us that we are addressing climate change, but they don't do the CSR and not expect a return. Um, so we really also need to interrogate um, as media, what is the economic system doing as far as climate issues is concerned. Don't forget also the economic system is a very major um, tool uh, for, the, for the government and for other regulatory frameworks. So if, if government wants to, to, to really touch the lives of, um, of the people, sometimes it interferes with the economic system. Look at the rise in fuel prices. They don't need to, to come to us to get money from our pocket. They just use the, the economic system to, uh, to come to, uh, to, to, to reach us. Um, then of course, um, we have the media uh, who we are discussing today as a stakeholder in climate. Media, you are our mouthpiece. You're the people who speak and we listen. At 7 p.m., 9 p.m., Kenyan time, all of us are seated listening to news. We have our favorite programs, our favorite talk shows. So really your role as far as um, climate is concerned cannot be uh, over and overestimated or underestimated. Sorry for repeating the economic systems. Then of course we have the legal and penal systems. How far can we go uh, for punishing climate offenders? Already you know we have environmental, environmental rules and regulations and laws which we are already having problems enforcing. Um, then of course we have language and we are going to see how language is coming in. I'm not a linguistic, uh, they are called linguists, not linguistic. <laughs> yeah, already we are going to see how language needs to come in. And of course um, the journalists will, will tell us why they broadcast in all language. But I'm yet to ask um, uh, our good moderator, uh, Mr. Waweru, how many of the local journalists would tell us what climate change is called in the language that they broadcast in. What is climate change in, in Luya, in Baluya, for example, in, in Luo, in Kikuyu, in Trukana? Do they know those languages? So that then we are able to make the meaning that we are uh, seeking as far as uh, climate is concerned. Next slide, please. Yes, as I go to the next slide, there's a very important question that we've been thinking about. Can I ask all the participants to kindly write in your local language uh, what climate change is. Uh, please put that on the Q&A. Thank you so much. There you go. Uh -huh. Thank you. So moving forward, this is a lot of literature because um, I really was just uh, typing in and writing in as I was um, thinking about it. Um, first, I thought about um, how do we need to get the, the um, journalists and the media excited about this? Because everybody does what excites them. They report about what excites them. And so I thought about a concept that I need to know whether it exists. And um, if we have climate politics, then we really need to have um, climate um, journalism vis-a-vis uh, -vis environmental journalism. And I want to make a recommendation uh, as far as this concerned, that we need to stop hiding the issues of climate in environment matters. Yes, of course, climate 
um, theoretically is an aspect of environment. We, we all want to argue that from, um, from our training right from primary school. But like we are saying today, we are deconstructing what has been usual. It's not business as usual. So we need to really deconstruct this environment thing and remove climate from there. We need to remove climate change from, 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 from environment. Yes, it is there, but if we are really going to appreciate its impact, my dear journalists and, 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 and our participants today, we need to remove that, you know, the way, the way like there's, there's a, a wall and then you remove one block and concentrate on that block. That could be the block that has the error that is causing the house not to stand. That is what we need to do with climate if we are going to give it meaning. So the first thing that I would propose is that uh, journalists need to cover and report um, from climate summits and conventions and therefore contribute to public debate and cl the climate crisis. You realize that it is journalists who generate dialogue by talking about the issues that are discussed at an international level. But I want to highlight one weakness and I don't want, allow me not to point to the journalists, but let everybody pick their portion in this. The issue of climate is discussed piecemeal. So there's, um, there was the IPP, uh, IPCC conference. We discuss it, we discuss it, and then when that is over, we close that chapter, and now we start airing issues, election, and leave that one. Then we go somewhere and um, a pipeline, a petrol pipeline has broken, and we pick that issue and we want to concentrate we left our climate agenda a long time ago. And that is why one of the one of the one of my title, one of my quotes as far as climate is concerned, is that we need to throw in the weighing scales when it comes to climate. We need to stop weighing when is it good to talk about it, when is it a hot issue. You know, the journalists have this um this um uh, narrative that they say that when, when they're defining news, that when a, when a dog bites a man is not news. But when the man bites the dog, that is news. When it comes to climate, we need to get that one off. The weighing scales need to be out so that then we are able to make issues climate our lifestyle. When those conventions are over, when we are done talking about the SDGs and the Vision 2030s and the African Union uh, um, goals and all those things, we need to continue um, talking about climate change because climate change is an everyday affair. Um, then the other proposal that I would like to have is that when it comes to climate issues, scientists are on their own, the activists and the advocates are on their own, policymakers are on their own. Can they have a common platform? This common platform, I would propose it to be provided by two people, the media, and number two, the CSO, the civil society organizations. You're the people who can bring these people together and consolidate their thinking, consolidate their actions. And don't forget, we also proposed that we need information cons uh, consolidated and possibly have, have not very many people and everyone talking about what climate change is. And then, of course, we are saying that these people need to talk directly to the people. Yes, talking on the media is good. But when we leave the media, where do we go? It is our habit. Like for example, if, if I asked us, who remembers the, new, uh, the, the issues that made news on Tuesday? Many of us will not remember. Possibly some will just come and say, okay, there was this, this uh, presidential aspirant who was saying this and the other one, but they will not remember the actual issues that were discussed in that program. So we need to continue speaking to the people because the message of climate is with the people. The impact on climate is with the people. We are also saying that the media, the, the media needs to translate the impacts of climate to an understandable language, a language that is easy for the people to understand and in a sustainable way. We can use the local stations. We have very many local stations in Kenya that can be used to demystify climate change to the common Mwanainchi through the language that they use. Um, recommendation number three ethnographic um, coverage for the journalists. We need stories, you know? Story, you, you, can, you can have documentaries, for example. Choose a community, choose a region, and walk with them the journey of the climate change 
adaptation, mitigation, and the actions they took to get where they are, tell those stories in an exciting manner. For me as a person, and I'm very enthusiastic about climate, but if you told me to choose between watching a movie or a documentary on climate and watching climate issues on, on news, I'll choose the documentary because that I'll be able to blend with it as a lifestyle. So we could also change the way we are, we are airing the uh, climate change issues and adopt the ethnographic method so that then you're able to work with the people two, three, five, ten 10 years and you're able to tell the story as it is. And these people tell the stories themselves. Um, the next one, number five, is that one of the biggest one of the biggest setbacks that we need to acknowledge um, that happens in the climate movement is communicating science in an acceptable, in an accessible and inclusive way. But for me, I want us to move away from science. When you receive a scientific, uh, when you receive scientific information, even if you translate it, you're still likely to translate it and it remains scientific. So for me, I want to charge. Um, the journalists and all the participants today, we need to have a way of communicating um, what climate science is producing to the people in a very good way, in an accessible way. What do I need as a grassroots person to reach information on climate? A lot of climate information is online, is on the website, but Mimi Kutoko Uko Mashinani, I live in Trukana, I live in uh, Wajir. How easy is it for me to reach the web, uh, the, the, uh, the information on the website. If already in this year of electioneering, we are still having a robust discussion and my good moderator allow me to mention this. Um, when, when IBC was checking out the number of polling stations that can transmit information and, and the poll results online, it was found quite a bunch cannot do it. Elections is a very key issue in, in, in the country, in Kenya. But if we are not able to do such a matter electronically, Sembuse and Mamboya climate change, we need to ask ourselves those hard questions. And the politicians who are going on board, because if you ask them, they'll promise, ah, oh yes, we'll sponsor those activities, we'll do this, act we'll provide information. Ask them, how will they provide information to that young person in the deep of society without even a smartphone. So that then we are able to revive um, the matters of public participation. We are able to revive the matters of really getting down to where the issues matter. Next slide, please. Uh, you got it. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah. Then we and are I, also seeing that. Um, now. Yeah, please. Yes, we are finishing this. I'll the other it. recommendation yeah. that I would, yeah, yeah, thank you. I'll I'll do it quickly. I'll summarize. Maybe you can oh. share the presentations later. Um, okay. I also wish to call upon um, the media and our politicians to humanize climate climate change. Uh, if you want human beings to feel the impact of something and desire to take action, tell them that this, this is what makes you lack food on the table. This is what is making your cow die. This is what is making your cow not have water. And so you have to resort to human wrestling. So I, I, play, I pray that the media, and I send my petition to the media to humanize climate change and, and make it even um, more frequent so that you're constantly putting in our minds what climate change can do to us and what we can be able to change about it. Then we are also saying that let us spend more time discussing solutions. If you look at um, the discussions on climate change, most of them are international. Oh, there was rising sea levels somewhere, there were so many deaths. But what do they do after that to mitigate that? We don't see it. So can we have more of discussions um, discussed, and especially with the politicians, the political leaders, because really this is one of their mandates to protect us and give us what is good. Um, let us discuss solutions and not discuss problems and, and data and analysis and findings and figures. Let us discuss um, the solutions to climate change. And the solutions is what I call climate action. Then we are also talking about um, Climate action show as much as climate uh, action and climate change news are globalized, they need to be localized as well. 
when you go to the website and um, I challenge each one of us to do so after this presentation and just type climate change and see the kind of um, information that comes up there. For us Kenyans, it's international. So can we have a way of ensuring that climate change is going to be with Japan because they are having earthquakes every now and then. So that is the challenge. The next recommendation that I want to give the journalists is to, is to exact political pressure as far as ability is concerned. To go to that political leader and ask him what do we expect him to be concerned? What bill have you proposed? How has it got challenged? How do you counter that challenge? And you can reach out for you. That's what it is on those who are violent. Okay. And these political leaders, when they go to parliament to make laws, they are under the direction of their speakers. So reach out to those speakers and ask them, what is the house doing as far as climate is concerned? And let us receive the answers and let us make it public. Don't go and hold the convention somewhere uh, in their office and then come and give us a news item for tweets. Just do it as, um, as a pack coverage so that they are really able to see that we are seeing it. And also after such a thing, I can be going to the next slide as I add this point. Um, after, your, after such a discussion with a political leader um, or the leader of a legislative house, then you need to come and also seek the opinion of the people. This was proposed, this was said, what do you think as a person at the grassroots? Is it working for you? Is it not working for you? The next one should be the last slide, uh, participants, and then we'll be done. Thank you. So this is a summary. So we just have um, sentences one by one. Um, and I want to say that um, in my opinion, journalism can make a big deal of anything. Did you see the way they made a big deal of gender? the gender issue, and it has become a point of discussion. Women in leadership, then now we are saying the boy child. So the, the media, really they pick this up and they want to make a big deal of it, they can do it and we will support them. Then also it's important to amplify achievements by political leaders concerning climate mandates because people have to be praised. So every other time, if I know when I do something about climate, they, my, that achievement is amplified, maybe I receive an award, maybe I receive a recognition, then you can be sure you will mainstream it. As much as we say we don't do something for the good of it, don't do something because you're going to get a reward, I think there's something that amplifying an achievement um, does. Then also this thing, uh, we say that we need to disaggregate environment to bring out climate as a key issue. I will not repeat that. Um, let's also have incentives for climate action, especially from the CSOs and from the government. We can also discuss that in another forum. But again, um, journalists can use this, can, can propose this, and it is picked up by government and relevant bodies. Let us also have a grassroots approach. Um, some these problems really emanate from, from, from an individual. So let us stop using that approach from starting from the top, going to the bottom. Let us reduce the high level discussions and have more of the um, uh, grassroots action so that we are able to have impact. And then last but not least, I propose more partnerships and funding on innovative climate actions, right from the planning to the evaluation stage. And at this point, as I end, I want to share with you the reason why I founded this, the Sustainable Climate Action in Africa Conference. And first, we, we, I called it the climate action because I didn't want us to discuss change anymore. We needed to discuss what we need to do. And the unique thing about that conference is that when it receives the conference papers and the um, participants present, those findings are tested. Now that testing is what we call action. And so what we are calling for is that we need more partnerships and more funding on this, so that we find more con conversations, discussions, and dialogues, but we are not finding. And the last not least, let us give all the actors I mean, and people like us that speak directly to each other, speak directly to each of their agendas, and also speak directly to the people. So with that, I hope I've been um, of, of much help in, in creating a brainstorm in your mind. I hope I've given you food for thought. I hope I've um, as far as he jambola ubadilikaji watabianchi is concerned, I didn't know how many knew that climate change in space ubadilikaji.
amazing. Um, indeed, you've learned a lot. I have to confess that you know uh, that in Swahili, and you broke a bit. Uh, we couldn't hear so well. If you could put it uh, on Q and A. Uh, speaking of which, uh, we've got amazing names um, in different beautiful dialects or languages from Kenya. Uh, on on, I, I don't want to you know read this because I, I don't know how I will pronounce this, but I'm thinking we'll have all of these and archive them and talk to a few uh, the people you know given us the names the local languages and see what we can do. Uh, maybe we can have we have tip sheets uh, on our website. Maybe this is something that we can add to. Uh, but I hope we put the names on the Q and A. Uh, because we able to archive uh, the questions and also uh, these uh, the translations into local languages. So if you're able to transfer that uh, from the chat to Q&A, that will really help us. I uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Frida Karani. There are so many uh, takeaway forms uh, that I'm not able to analyze uh, with the time that we have. Uh, but, but you know, I, I like everything, and I hope all our participants, you know, liked this. Uh, especially, you know, learning how to, you know, uh, to to get better uh, into the language uh, of and understanding the science uh, of climate change, so that we able to scrutinize better our leaders, those in those in in leadership. Uh, so, so that we able to scrutinize them better, ask uh, those deep questions, and even for us to be able to break down the science, the jargon, and to tell these stories through the people. Uh, who live uh, uh, through climate change uh, every day. Thank you so much for that. We have several questions. I uh, will come to them after we uh, we done uh, with our fourth speaker. Uh, but now we'll quickly go uh, to Dr. Jackson uh, Kenyanjui. And I hope, uh, Dr. Ri, you are able to do this in 10, 15 minutes uh, max. And Dr. Jackson yeah. Kenanjui, yeah, is a man who inspires me so much. Uh, he's the East African Regional Coordinator for the project, and he's a founder, Climate Change Awareness Kenya, and he's vying for the speaker seat of county assembly uh, in Nakuru County. He tell us more about himself and why. Uh, uh, he's left. Um, um, he's left. You know the academia uh, and work uh, to move into politics and leadership of Nakuru County, and of course tell us a bit uh, his interest in climate change and what he thinks uh, of Kenya and climate change and and politics basically and the green agenda. Uh, the floor is yours, Dr. Kinyanjui. Uh, you can share your PowerPoint. Thank you so much. Can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, I can. Loud and clear. Okay. Okay, let me share my screen. Um, uh, you can confirm if you're able to see my screen on your end. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. So I'll take the minimum time possible. That is uh, 10 minutes. So in regard to this, uh, as you have heard, my name is Dr. Jack Kinyanjui Koimbori, and I'm basically uh, a profession in matters of climate change. My PhD is in agricultural climatology uh, and also energy expert on the same. Uh, also, I was able to do a master's on the same on matters at science in Uppsala University in Sweden and also another master's from Kenyatta University on matters climate change. So climate and matters environment has been my kind of uh, cup of coffee, as you may say. So I'm the regional coordinator for East Africa uh, Climate Reality Project, which is headed by Al Gore, who is the former vice president of USA. Apart from that, I've been awarded various uh, awards. I've been, uh, uh, I was the Nakuru County Youth Environmental Award winner. Also, at the moment, uh, I've held a few um, positions on matters climate, which you can be able to see it through my profile and the website when you go to climatechangekenya.org 
or when you go to my Twitter space, that is at Kinyanjui001. So let me begin off by talking about the power of electing leaders with climate change plans. And as you have come to learn is that I'm fine, I went into the political space, basically to try to change the conversation that is outside there. So in regard to that, I've been able to engage myself in various media appearances from Voice of America, uh, which was talking about matters climate change from NTV, local media stations, KTN, Citizen TV. I've appeared in all media stations in Kenya and also in print media on matters, climate change and environment. So this is a space that I've worked with. Also, I've worked with various projects from UNDP and NGOs on matters rising water levels, where I was able to employ my skills as a GS expert to look into how the waters are rising. So when you go into my website, you'll be able to find a software where I was able to come up with a 3D simulation, where, I'll be, where I was able to actually simulate floods uh, occurring in Africa, basically, using the GIS software. And that is something I've pitched with TEDx, and hopefully I'll be able to be selected at TEDx to pitch that idea. So moving on is that uh, I was able to sample a few leaders uh, from Kenya and beyond. And these are some of the tweets they came up with. Looking at uh, my left, we have former health minister at TMP who say that forests do not bring rain. Rains, br uh, rain bring forest. That's a statement from the political leaders. Also, we have uh, Honorable Sabina Chege who in a tweet pointed out that I have for a long time period of time been concerned about the forest that was put up by KTD around Gitwamba area. This afternoon, I had a meeting with KTD officials concerning the issue of this forest. We have agreed now that they have harvested their trees. They will not plant the, the trees again in the farm. The villagers have had concerns of insecurity and extreme cold spells. So they are calling for deforestation, not even planting more trees because they believe those trees bring, bring in more cold as opposed to rain. And then also we have famous quotes and tweets from Trump. Trump made so many famous quotes on climate change. The, these are just but a few. I'll be able to share the slides with you. I won't go into detail into all of them. But you can see the first one talking about the concept of global warming was created and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. So these are some of the tweets. And you can see how many retweets it has had. So that's what I'm telling you, the strength of political leaders when it comes to a statement they make, the followers are many. This one was retweeted. Uh, the first one was retweeted around 81,000 times. 81,000 times is a lot. So that one tells you the power of it. And uh, when you look at the state of climate change uh, moving on from where we came and where we are right now, climate change and the temperatures are on the rise. So this is the facts that we have. And the facts, as usually say, we usually say as scientists that they are stubborn. So we cannot run away from the facts. So when you look at even the ozone layer depletion over the years, the ozone layer has been depleting over the years. So when you look at science, science speaks a lot. It speaks facts that climate change is there. And we are the huge contributors of it. When you look at from the industrial era up to now, we are the worst contributors in terms of greenhouse gases emissions and all these things. Uh, with a few records here and there, when you look at even the top 10 hottest records, even 16, they're talking about the hottest years in modern history. 16 out of the seven have been recorded to have occurred after the year 2000. This one tells you that uh, it coincides with the flood scenarios we're experiencing because most of the lakes in Africa and even in Kenya, even globally, they started rising uh, from the year 2000. And most of them even in Kenya started rising as from 2010. So this coincides with the rise in temperatures globally. Uh, we have wildfires globally, which are a sign of these climate change effects and global warming. And this has just but a few of the pictures that we have from Brazil, from even Kenya, from Australia, even from uh, USA, where we had the highest temperatures being recorded in uh, Death Valley in USA at around even 54 degrees. So we have cases of heat waves and the rest. Floods have been on the rise. Here I'm talking about African cases. We have Sudan, uh, South Sudan have been affected by floods, Kenya, and globally. So you see, these are not just a one area event, it's a global event. When you look at droughts, these are some of the effects of climate change. Droughts have been experienced. Uh, in Kenya, we had an estimated 2 million people being affected by the impacts of uh, aridity and uh, drought. And these are some of the effects we're talking about. And that's why I'm saying we need climate change oriented leaders because some of these treaties and uh, signs that we are signing in treaties, 
they are led by political leaders. When you look at even the COP26, when you look at the national determined contributions that we are signing, when you look at even the green, the green, uh, the green fund, which was up to a tune of 100 billion uh, every year, the leaders are the ones who are supposed to be uh, looking into that money, whether it has, they have actually uh, added that money to that kitty, of which it was not, they were not able to last year. It, uh, they had only a, a must, uh, a tune of around 60 uh, billion out of the 100 billion that we need. And that 100 billion is supposed to be tapped by the developing nations because we have suffered at the expense of developing nation, of developed nations. Because right now they're telling us to cut our carbon emissions, stop using coal and the rest. And yet that is what made them to become developed. So if they're telling us to stop using it, and that is one source of energy that we know can help help to cut up Africa to become a developed nation, then we said we needed that 100 billion every year to use that in developing our countries or nations of which they are not serious on that. So we are hoping the COP27, which will be held in Egypt this year with the theme of adaptation and mitigation, we will be able to touch on those matters. So when you look at all this journey that we had on climate change from 2019, from 2009, where you had COP, uh, COP15 up to 2019, the major agreements that we had here, they were all made by leaders and political leaders. It's only in COP21 uh, where we had the highest signatories of around 197 nations. And you see all those years, it was not possible because the leaders were not participating in this uh, signing of treaties. So what I'm saying is that we need leaders who are climate oriented, who are environmentally oriented, and they have climate passion in them. And that's why I'm saying we look at Al Gore, the former vice president of USA. He was a climate change uh, activist. And him being the vice president of USA, he was able to channel and to spearhead what we call environmental matters up to the top level. Uh, when you look at the former presidents of Kenya, I try to look at this in terms of the forest cover. When Jomo Kenyatta was the president, the forest cover of Kenya was around was above 10 percent. When Moi came into the era, the forest cover dropped where people uh, actually encroached in the mouth forest. The forest cover dropped up to almost five to four percent. Mwaiki Baki increased it and then Uhuru Kenyatta now was able to be part and parcel of the COP21 where he was able to sign into the bond challenge. The bond challenge is the one that calls into the planting of trees. This is one of the nature-based solutions that people were calling for in reducing the impacts of climate change. That is the act as carbon sequesters. So Kenya uh, allocated itself 5.1 million hectares. It would be planted for trees. So 5.1 million hectares out of the total surface area of Kenya is 10%. And I'm happy to say that right now from the last statistics I had, we are actually around 10% or above. It was around 9.7% forest cover. And I think you have surpassed that to maybe 10.1. So we are moving there. But all that said and done, we have African countries that have a forest cover of around 89%, 80. Gabon has 89. And they actually received what we call uh, the carbon credits, they were given uh, around 17 million US dollars for just planting those trees and uh, they are paid by countries that don't have the forest cover. So you have to pay another country that has the forest cover because you, you are not able to plant. So you pay others to plant something that can absorb the pollution you're emitting. So they were paid 17 million US dollars and this is money they'll be, uh, they'll be paid every year. So there's an importance of planting trees and all these trickles down to the type of leader you have. So if your leader is not environmentally oriented, then expect the forest cover to reduce. When you look at the Kenyan president, as I said, the track records of these presidents in terms of environment, it matters. I was able to score them uh, from Uru Kenyatta to Jomo Kenyatta. Uru Kenyatta had an A minus compared to Jomo Kenyatta with an F. Moe Kibati had a, had a B because he was able to improve it and then Kenyatta took over. Uru Kenyatta took over. In terms of renewable energy, plastic ban, plastic ban Kenyatta had an A minus because when it comes to the plastic ban that was issued, it was issued in his era. This is something good. Fossil fuel, I've given him a D because we are yet to move away from fossil fuel dependent kind of energy. We are yet to embrace electric energy, solar energy and the rest. At least we are having uh, electric charged vehicles. I've seen electric charged motorcycles. And they also, uh, and also Kenya is creating non-motorized uh, transport uh, pathways which is part of the national determined contribution. So I'm saying there is something that is happening and I'm happy about that. In terms of fossil fuel, also I'm happy to say that 
Kenya and the activists at, uh, at large in Kenya, they were able to lobby and to stop Kenya from setting up the coal plant that they were due to set up in Lamu. So that one was stopped. So you can see these are things that we're working towards. And uh, I can say is that the future is still bright with the leaders who are environmentally oriented. Uh, when you look at the Kenya changing forest cover, as I said, in 1963, it was around 10% during Kenyatta. In 1990s, when it was Moise era, it came to 2%. And then 2013, in between here, it increased where Kibaki was holding the REM. And then 2013 up to now, we are now at 10%. We are now recovering. So you can see the drop down that happened in between because of the leaders that we had. Uh, the Kenya's arms of government, I won't talk about that. This is what we have in Kenya and in most of the African countries. When you see all this chain of commands, they all have their own roles when it comes to environmental matters. And when one arm of government fails, then you don't expect that all matters of environment will be protected, all will be uh, pushed forward in terms of legislations and laws. I'm happy to see that we have laws against poaching and the use of ivory. I can see we have laws against plastic use, but still we have black markets where the plastic bags are still coming in. So it means that we need to have a mind change and a mindset change from the educational level. So some of the solutions which I advocated for is we need to have a curriculum, a curriculum in education sector that is uh, environmentally kind of oriented so people can be taught at an early age so that we don't have this problem with the people. So when you look at the structure of Kenya and the politicians, there are so many from county assemblies to governors, we have so many of them and none of them, very few of them, they're environmentally oriented and this is a huge problem. Areas of environmental and climate change politics I talked about in terms of global issues, transitional issues, transboundary issues, fundamental conflicts, and also global common, uh, commons and shared natural resources. We have been having conflicts in Kenya uh, where people are fighting for basic resources such as water, grass for feeding, and this just because of climate change issues, making one county drier than the other. So people go and encroach into other people's areas and spaces creating a huge problem. Uh, so these are just some of these transitional boundaries and problems. I won't go into it, I'll share the slides with you. And when you look at some of the fossil fuel companies that are controlling politics, both in Africa and also in the world, we have in BP, Shell, ExxonMobil and Total. All these companies have played a huge role in the American politics, be the Republican and the, uh, the Republican and the, I've forgotten the other name. So they play a huge role in determining what kind of leaders are there. So when you look at the, the, the scenario of politics, the money that is injected into their campaigns by these fossil fuel companies, then it will play a huge role in this politician making any kind of decision. So when you take black money, this is what I call black money, then you expect the leaders to have decisions that are swayed towards environment. And then these companies are there, look at the money they have spent, these companies are still betting on fossil fuel, the money they have spent in investing in energy sectors and even in politicians. So uh, I think uh, in terms of that, let me move to something else. Even companies uh, that have played, uh, companies in support of climate change, Coca-Cola has played a huge role in ensuring that they have recyclable bottles, but we are still talking to them to see how best they can stop the use of plastic bottles that they are using, the single use plastics. We don't want single use plastics, we, have, we want plastic that can remain in use because a single a plastic itself has a lifespan of 400 years. So you see all these things, they have a ripple effect to the environment. Uh, the history of climate change politics, I won't go into this, but you all know that uh, the, when uh, Trump was at the helm of politics, he actually pulled USA out of the Paris Agreement. And I'm happy to see that after uh, Biden was sworn in, the first sign or the first uh, treaty he signed was returning USA into the Paris Agreement. So that one tells you what kind of leaders you have and which direction they'll take you depending on whether they take environment as a hoax or not. So the reason behind the Trump's move, I won't talk about that. So top five reasons why Trump pulled out these are political issues, I won't touch on, to, on to that. And maybe something else I needed to touch on, uh, the last thing is, uh, Biden has done so many milestones on climate change. I would touch into that, but there are so many you'll be able to look into the slide. But the bottom line, uh, maybe which I need to touch on is that uh, when you look at the top 10 countries leading in wind energy, solar energy, China is leading 
in solar energy. I'm happy to see the president is doing something there. And when you look at some of these developing nations, they are leading in solar energy. So people are shifting to clean and renewable energy. We are having wind power. And basically, let me just wind up there because I've rushed you because I'll share the slides with you. But the bottom line here is that uh, once you elect leaders that are climate oriented, expect good results. You cannot elect a leader who does not know the importance of the environment and expect them to protect that environment. So I think I'll stop there, but I'll remind you to just go to my Twitter space that is at Kinyanju001 or go to um, the website for climate change that is climatechangekenya.org and maybe the YouTube channel that is uh, climatechangekenya.org uh, just climatechangekenya.org don't separate them, search it on YouTube I have so many videos I've done, uh, videos on different topics on matters, climate change, and just search my names and you'll find it. Just search Dr. Jackson Kinyanju Kwembori, and you'll even find the videos I've done on Voice of America, on matters environment, interviews I've done on NTV, KTN, Citizen, on all these nation, on all these TV stations on matters environment. So let me stop there, but saying that thank you so much for giving me this space, and uh, I, I, I actually hope to see more uh, uh, more engagement kind of engagement especially for the media the fourth estate that is the media and the newsprint media people when they are writing this information they should do a background check and source for information from climate change experts before writing anything because once they put an information that is not substantiated which is false then they are giving a hard time in creating awareness on matters climate change thank you so much Thank you, uh, Dr. Kinyanjui. Uh, that's uh, you know quite engaging and deep. Uh, thank you so much for you, all your knowledge, all your education uh, on this topic, and you a great uh, resource. Uh, you know, going with the, your final you know comment, and that's why we at Internews of Journalism Network we do this kind of engagement, uh, so that we can bring experts to you to the media, so that they can be able you know to talk to you. And uh, we hope that uh, you allow us, all of you speakers, Shibi to Dr. Karani, uh, to Mr. Morris, you'll allow us to share your contacts so that uh, our, you know, any journalists can get in touch with you. And thank you so much uh, for your presentation. It has so many elements, uh, historical, even scorecards uh, for the government. Uh, I, I see comparing, uh, you know, the first president to the fourth president, uh, the, the first and the second, you have a bit of Fs and we have Bs and the minuses. Uh, and I think we, you know, the future is hopeful uh, and, and we're doing well. So if we bring that partnership, uh, Dr. Karani spoke about uh, between politicians and the media, for the media to be able to show these stories better, I think then uh, we, start, we start at a better place. I'll show you a presentation as you promised uh, with uh, all the team in our resource email that we sent later. Uh, looking at the chat, uh, people are asking where they'll get the recording. Uh, immediately, we have the recording we upload uh, on our YouTube channel and also on our uh, on our website. That is earthjournalism, uh, you know, dot, dot net. Uh, so be sure to check there, and we'll also say that uh, in the email that we'll have all the resources. Uh, so right now. Uh, we, we, we want to end this at six and we have a lot of questions. Uh, so we have our last speaker uh, who I'll have to apologize was not uh, in our graphic uh, because we've engaged you know, late after this. And thank you so much, uh, Mr. Maurice Akavai for agreeing to, to join this webinar, even at uh, you know, a very late date. Uh, and Mr. Maurice Kavai is the Deputy Director, Climate Change and Air Quality and monitoring at uh, the Nairobi County. And he'll be talking about uh, his county's climate action. Thank you so much, Mr. Kavai. Uh, we're so glad to have you uh, to, to talk to someone uh, in, 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 uh, in a position of leadership uh, in our government. Uh, the floor is yours. Are you free to share your presentation? Thank you. Mr. Kavai, I hope you can hear me.
uh, it seems like um, Banda Morris is having a challenge. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Please, uh huh. You're unmuted now. Uh, try to speak. Oh, um, I think I'll come to you and you try to see what the problem could be. Uh, in the meantime, I'll ask uh, the other panelists to be on standby. I could ask a few questions as we try to solve the audio with Mr. Morris. Uh, so we have a first question from, and by the way, panelists, I'll kind of ask you to, if you look at the Q&A icon, uh, you will see uh, you can answer live and type your uh, type your answer, please, uh, because we are not able to answer most of these questions. Kindly look at uh, the one that is addressed to you and try to type in your answer. Uh, and thank you so much for that. But I want to read the first one that we got uh, from Victor Muturi, uh, who is asking, uh, campaigns are ongoing in, on in Kenya. Others have tabled their manifestos, but are those manifestos not single clause talking about climate issues? Does it mean that politicians have not been empowered uh, concerning climate? Um, I, I hope if that question has not been answered already, uh, Mboturi, uh, one of the panelists, will uh, will help answer this. Uh, maybe Dr. Karani uh, or, or, or Dr. Kenyanjui and, and Chibi as well. And Maurice Kavai, uh, who is waiting to speak to us, is talking about uh, that political parties need to incorporate climate change action with their manifestos, and that's related to that question by Moturi. Um, William Ogonda asked, is it possible that Italy carries out an urgent training on how best to interrogate matters, climate change when packaging election news? We always strive to do that, um, Mr. William Ogonda, and that's why we actually having this webinar uh, is one of, like I started, uh, we, we have given story grants we uh, to do this kind of stories. We've done this webinar and we bring in experts to try and answer this question. And we then uh, also connect you uh, with these resource people. One thing I also uh, you know, like to report as uh, Asha and Mr. Kavai is that uh, uh, Dr. Kenyanju spoke about COP27 uh, uh, happening in Africa, in Egypt uh, in November. And we super excited about that. And what we've done, we've partnered with uh, the Rwanda a Media Commission, and we're planning to have a pre-COP uh, for just the media uh, to happen in Kigali, Rwanda, in about September, uh, which will bring all the experts, if we are able, uh, from COP and experts from, you know, across East Africa uh, to talk to the media across East Africa about what to expect uh, from the COP and how to report uh, with an African, you know, Afrocentric mind as we always do i uh, will put in uh, applications for you to apply one uh, to attend the pre-cop uh, conference uh, in kigali uh, and also uh, uh, for the participants will get this to also compete uh, to be able uh, to get grants uh, to attend uh, the cop 27 in egypt uh, so uh, we, 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 we are in our mailing list and we share all these resources with you as soon as possible. Uh, so that's you know one of the ways we do uh, to, to try to incorporate these trainings uh, with the topical issues of the day. Uh, Mr. Morris, uh, I see your presentation. Could you please try talk to us, see if your sound is working now? If you could unmute, please. There you go. I can't hear you. Uh, do you have earphones? Maybe you could try, you know, try without them. Or the other way around, if you don't, I can't see your video very well.
Okay. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. uh, am I audible now? Yeah, that works. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, my name is uh, Maurice Kavai, and I'm the I'm the head of climate change and air quality monitoring, Nairobi City County. And I want to take this opportunity to share with you uh, Nairobi City County Climate Action Plan, which we just launched the other day. And I want just to give a brief reason as to why we, long, we, we launched the Climate Action Plan. Um, we realized that uh, this city is it's growing at a very high rate. And also the city presents is, is actually the city has, you know, all the characteristics of being affected by climate change, and we realize that um, it may not take, um, it may not be very possible for us to be able to come up with a legal framework. So, in our daily um, activities, we got um, a partner who was able to, you know, work with us and uh, develop a climate action plan. And I want to say that this is a process which started about three years ago. Uh, we got some support from uh, seaport cities and we developed uh, the climate action plan together for the last three years. Um, we also developed uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, it was completed in the year 20, uh, 2019. So with us, apart from the climate action plan, we have um, the city's greenhouse gas emission which you also plan to also um, update. It's supposed to be updated yearly. Uh, we also plan to update it. So some of the issues which um, really affects the, the city, which really contributes to climate change, include uh, transport, um, waste management, and um, flooding, which is also a high risk because of uh, you know the because of the infrastructure. Uh, the, 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 the drain engine infrastructure, which actually is affected when uh, there is a lot of rain. We also have a lot of uh, emissions from uh, vehic vehicles. As um, people move around the city, there's a lot of emissions. So we realized that uh, pollution was actually going uh, up because uh, we also tested a street. There's a street called uh, Luthuli Street and um, what we did along with Thule is that um, we decided to make it a one-way street. And we realized that um, when we changed that street into one-way street, we are able to reduce pollution at a greater extent. We also realized that, um, that there was need to even make um, you know, uh, the infrastructure for, 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 for walking so that people can be able to walk along the city. And some of the plans which we are seeing actually in the city, whereas or, or, or rather aligns to one some of the actions. You have seen um, with the partnership with the Nairobi Metropolitan Services, there's a lot of uh, constructions of walkways. We're also trying to move um, most of the stages, Matato stages out of town, so that we can reduce emissions within the city. Um, <clears throat> We also working with uh, Namata to come up with a, a transport corridor, and some of these uh, processes are going to ensure that uh, the city is congested and they reduced some of the emissions we have. We have also done a lot of uh, the, the non motorized transport. I've just said, uh, especially you can be able to walk from the upper part of Nairobi, that is uh, Valley Road. Uh, you can be able to access CBD by walking along the, the city, as you can see in this picture. And as you can see, um, we are also working um, together in increasing the parks. Actually, we have done um, several parks. You can see this is um, part of uh, what used to be, we have the Sai Park, uh, we have Michuki Park, we also have a lot of green in the city so that we can be able to even, apart from increasing the, you know, the green uh, part of the, the city, we also increasing, um, you know, we also, we also trying to move uh, at other stages out of the city. Then um, on waste management, um, the city has really invested in um, 
the circular way of uh, managing waste, uh, we realized that uh, the city really contributes or rather generates about uh, 3,000 tons of waste, which is a burden for the city to be able to manage that, uh, that waste, which is collected daily and taken to the final disposal, that is Nandora. So amongst one of the plans which we really, which we have already started is um, constructing what we call a material recovery facilities. And as we talk, we have about uh, three of them which are almost near in completion. This material recovery facilities will be able to facilitate sorting of waste and the recovery of materials to the extent that um, people can even be, we can be able to reduce the amount of waste which is going to the final disposal. Um, we're also going to ensure that um, the, the individuals or rather the, the, com the community-based organization who forms part of our primary collectors um, are going to get um, some green jobs by you know, scavenging and collecting um, the recyclable materials from these facilities. We also envision the um, cost of uh, even managing the waste because we almost pay almost 1 billion every, every year to manage the waste, um, you know, from that is from transportation all the way to the final disposal. So, as um, <clears throat> this is just um, a demonstration of um, the, you know, the circular economy of whatever we are doing. Then we're also working with um, our partners, and one of the biggest uh, partner we have is um, Sanaji. Uh, they collect uh, about uh, eight tons of market waste from uh, the, the waste in our markets, that is the organic waste. And they're involved actually in the, the manufacture of uh, organic manure uh, through the biological processes of rearing the black soldier flies. So they have, have come and, uh, they have come in and we are able to collect, uh, they are able to actually sort our market because we realize that in the city, we really generate about about sixty percent of the waste which generated in the city is actually uh, organic waste. So some of this initiative, also the initiative which we are packed, we are packaged in our climate action plan, and we are able to seek for more partners so that we can be able to actually reduce the amount of waste which is going to our final disposal. Um, this is just an illustration of uh, material recovery facilities which are going to really reduce the issue of waste. Then there's also the issue of um, the energy. Um, as a city, um, in our action plan, we have prioritized uh, clean energy options. And um, like the last financial year, we have been able to even replace about 10,000 uh, street lights with the uh, LED, you know, those energy saving uh, maps. And uh, it's an initiative which is going to, to continue so that we can have, um, we can be able to reduce the amount of energy which is being consumed in the city. Then um, <clears throat> we are also in the process of up upgrading um, the slums. Um, there are several projects, especially in the special planning area where we are prioritized. And we are able to, we have been able in a way um, to help the, vulnerability, the vulnerabilities of these um, the people who live in those slums. We have constructed um, access roads uh, for emergency services. We also give providing um, them with um, water. Uh, there's water boosting services which are ongoing. And then there's also connection to con connection, connecting them to sewers. And then those who cannot be able to have um, this kind of infrastructure, there are partners who have come on board and they are providing what we call on-site sanitation just to save them from you know, uh, the issues of diseases in case um, they do not have this, uh, this kind of sanitation services. Then um, we also enhance in uh, water security um, by providing um, you know, prepaid water services in the communities. And um, we have enhanced our water supply services to about 55%. Uh, most of the households in the city are also covered. And we also plan as a city to inject more 
resources so that we can be able to actually provide more water to the to the city and when it comes to uh, agriculture um which is one of our pillars which we want to address is about a resilient food systems so we have urban agriculture the individuals who are actually doing um, a lot of farming and what the city has done is that um, it has developed a policy on uh, food systems and it is partnering with um, child fund practical action to be able to come up with the strategies which can really reduce the amount of wastage especially on food and especially on um, wastage of food because you realize that um, this food is also being used the wastage the waste food is also being used by farmers uh, who are turning it in who are turning it into composite, uh, composite uh, manure um there's also high demand of this organic this uh, food um our partners who are doing um, uh, black soldier fly uh, the ones who are rearing crickets they are really um creating a dem high demand of uh, you know uh, the food waste and we are, we, are we are realizing that um, we can be able to even create sustainable um, demand of this uh, waste, uh, that is food waste, and then, uh, you know, create products can be also, which can be plowed back into the system. Then um, on green spaces, um, as a city, we envision the city to be the green, um, green city as it used to be. So we have done quite um, a lot. Uh, we have done some so many projects you can see whenever we are doing a project our main focus is ensuring that there is the element of green in that facility whether it is a health facility if it is a street if it is around a roundabout we are able to even green that particular place then um, when it comes to improving the health standards of um, the, the, the Nairobians uh, a lot has been done we also launched um, the Nairobi Air Quality Act, and now we are going to work on uh, the regulations uh, with support from partners. And I want to mention that um, <clears throat> before we started doing the air quality policy, there was a lot of public outcry, especially from residents in uh, the industrial areas. And um, this one made us to sit down together, together with the members of the county assembly, and we started putting uh, down measures to come up with a policy so that we can be able to address uh, issues of air pollution in the city, which are really affecting our communities. So this is a process which took about two years. And we, as we talk, we have an act in place and we are really, uh, we are really working on the regulation so that we can be able to sort out the issues of uh, air pollution. Um, there was a lot of challenges when when it came to addressing um, you know air, air, air quality um, you know challenges, uh, especially on complaints, because the city did not have any legal framework to do that. But we believe that when we have the legal framework, we can be able to address the issues of air pollution um, you know uh, with, with with evidence because without evidence, we cannot be able to prosecute anybody. And we do not have, we don't want to have our stakeholders, you know, even taking us to court because maybe we have arrested them or we are, we are charging them for uh, non, uh, the offenses which have not uh, committed. Then um, we also focused on um, implementing uh, the, the climate action plan. Um, we have some assistance from um, UK aid and, um, one of the things which you want to focus on is we, have, we implement on the, the, the West, um, the West, um, the West interventions, and also on the energy interventions. We also I and now you can be able to bring on board stakeholders to be able to tap in on the gap which is, is which is in existence. Right now, the city does not have a climate change act, which we believe is a very vital document or rather it's a very vital element when it comes to fight uh, to the climate to fight against climate change in the city so we believe we'll be able to get um, um, partners on board who are going to assist us in coming up with the climate change um, policy uh, finance policy 
and also the climate change chart, which is um, a very important um, framework for us to be able to implement the, the climate action. And especially when it comes to resource allocation uh, from the county assembly, it is very difficult to be able to convince uh, the committee on finance on um, why you need this money and you not have a climate change act. So we believe that um, once we have partners on board, we'll be able to come up with that framework then we will join the rest of the counties in Kenya who have developed the Climate Change Act as so that we can be able to mainstream uh, the climate change um, actions in our development plans. I'm not saying that we are not doing um, action related to uh, climate change, but it is always good to be have a legal framework where uh, these interventions are going to, to lie. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Maurice. Again, we so much appreciate uh, you doing this presentation. Uh, we thought it's very important, um, Nairobi being, you know, the capital city and probably with, uh, you know, challenges uh, on city development vis-a-vis -vis the environment and, um, and, uh, and the climate. And uh, it's good to see that you uh, you have a climate action and you're actually calling it climate action uh, because probably you realize it's time to act now. And 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 I see William Abala, if you look at Q&A uh, from KBC in Kenya, are saying that uh, for us, the media, we don't tell these stories much. He's aware about the Nairobi, uh, you know, climate action, but he's saying that nobody you know, reported about it, uh, even though you launched it uh, the other day. Uh, so probably these two ads are to look more uh, into this and scrutinize, you know, more uh, what counties are, are doing. Uh, you've said the Nairobi County doesn't have a climate policy or a climate act uh, that you're working to. And, and I think uh, this is one of a story idea to look at other counties that have, you know, climate actions. We know a couple, but unfortunately we couldn't uh, be able to have them or even even uh, be, be able to have all many speakers in a one and a half hour uh, webinar that we are going down to two hours and we've not addressed uh, the, uh, the the q a yet so we, we do hope you will let us share uh, again uh, your presentation if you could send that to me and also your contacts uh, so that uh, our good friends uh, from the, from the media can follow up uh, with you and see what they are able to report, not only on this, but on what you're doing. And of course, able to scrutinize that and do more, you know, background checks, you know, like when it comes to, you know, like, uh, like we know how we have the problem of, you know, waste uh, in this country. But if you look at other countries like, uh, like in Europe, uh, if you Google about Sweden and climate waste, uh, you'd be shocked to see that they panic when they don't have enough and they actually uh, import from other countries because that's what they use uh, for, you know, uh, to, for, for, for energy uh, to light their homes and to warm their homes uh, during winter. And, and, and we, we have a lot of waste uh, in Nairobi. If we could change, take that to, uh, you know, <laughs> make that energy to be a win-win, uh, we, uh, we save our climate as well as save uh, our electricity bill. And we know how big that is. So thank you so much uh, to all our panelists. I'm afraid we don't have time uh, for Q&A. Uh, I don't know uh, the three minutes we have, if we can address two. Unfortunately, even for our, our good colleagues, uh, we've not asked questions uh, like are directed uh, to particular panelists. Uh, that we able to answer, uh, but Dr. Frida, there is a question that you have indicated you would like to answer live. Are you able to take that? Uh, the one on reality is a point that climate change is already here. True, uh, this Masivula Emmanuel, uh, he says back in 2020, I did reports on solution, journalism, reporting on environment in Sierra County. I realized that only farmers know and face the change themselves. There are politicians know about climate change, but ignore implementation. 
the only solution is the implementation should become because journalists report all in vain. What is that? What should be done about this? Um, Dr. Karani. What should be done about uh, implementation? <laughs> or any other speaker you know, that can speak about this? Uh, I think it's Dr. Karani uh, who say that uh, uh, we have, you know, like a, a lot of good policies uh, that we just put uh, on the shelf and we don't do much about that. How can we ensure uh, that is implementation of this? Dr. Frida. Victor Moturi, uh, can climate change subjects be included into media schools and colleges curriculum? Dr. Uh, Kenyanjui, uh, if you could take both. Yeah, so uh, my, my answer is simple. Eh? We need to look into how best we can be able to work well with the leaders and especially when the leaders who are vying, try to look into those leaders who have climate change manifestos in their agenda, which is one thing. And also in the same, we need to see how best we can be able to implement more of this through streamlining of this legislation and laws. Because you have seen that counties have laws, they have these amendments, the county climate change uh, bill and acts and all these things. But we need to see how best we can be able to streamline all these things. So one of the presidential candidates that I've seen who has been doing something is Wajakoya, who said he will plant a lot of... Uh, of, uh, of marijuana, which is a green plant, which is a good uh, carbon sequester. That's the only thing I've seen in terms of environment, but uh, all in all is that uh, I think we need to interrogate our leaders on those who have climate change manifestos and see how best we can be able to elect them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kenyanjui. Uh, do you know if we have climate change as a subject? Um, yes, you know yeah. I mean? okay. like, yeah. yeah, like, mm -hmm. Yes, I used to be a high school teacher, uh, teaching geography also. So yes, we don't have it as a subject on itself, but it is within the geography aspect that uh, high schools have. In um, primary school, they have it within science, uh, and also they have environmental studies. So it is somewhere within there, but we need it to have a life of its own. We need it to have uh, a title of its own, let it be a subject on its own, that is climate change on itself, because there are so many aspects within climate change that make it to be uh, stand alone instead of being absorbed within a topic or uh, within a subject. Thank you. Yeah, and I think Moturi brings an interesting angle to it. How can we include that in media schools and colleges? Uh, I think that's a uh, food for thought uh, because mostly we don't have these special specializations uh, in media schools. We, we just you know, know how to be a journalist, how to gather news, how to be ethical, but we don't go, you know, specifically uh, into these. Uh, and Mikia says it's alleged there are cartels in Dandora that make it difficult to construct garbage recycling infrastructure. How do you hope to deal with that, Mr. Morris Kavai? That is for you. Um, I didn't get it. Can you? It's alleged that there are cartels in Dandora that make it difficult to construct garbage recycling infrastructure there. How do you hope to deal with that? Okay, um, well, um, the city has a plan to decongest um, Dandora. Um, the reports which we have is that um, Dandora got filled long time ago. And then because the, Andorra, the city did not have any other place where they could be able to or rather uh, dispose of the waste, um, the mechanisms which they have put in place is to have that waste. Um, um, there's a lot of, um, uh, it's called, um, that waste is combusted every, every day. There are machines which are working um, day and night to make sure that they reduce uh, waste accumulation on that particular place. And um, the only way which we can be able to reduce 
uh, the interest in waste. From my technical point of view, is by making the process easier, in such that um, you do not have a lot of waste going to that particular place. Because the cartels which we have in Dandora are there because they are scavenging, they are looking for valuables. And as you can see, we have already started a process of developing the material recovery facilities, which are going to um, allow um, waste actors to pick what they want before th that waste is delivered to the final disposal. So in due time, we will find that um, the people, or rather the waste actors, will be able to scavenge what is important before uh, the final, before that waste is transported to the final disposal. So whatever will be left, will see its way to the final disposal, will be that waste which cannot be utilized in any way. So in the long run, we'll have those cartels becoming waste actors, but are not at the final disposal, but in the infrastructures which we also created. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kavai. I hope uh, Anne Mikia, your question has been answered. Unfortunately, that's all the time we had uh, for this. Um, if you have a pressing question, kindly uh, forward. I see most of the, of the panelists have put their contacts uh, on the chat and Q&A. Like, you know, kindly reach out to them. Uh, if you looked at the chat, uh, there was some animated conversation there, and one of it is connected to, you know, journalism and university and schools. And today, and in most of the webinars that we do nowadays, we uh, we make an effort to reach out to journalism students. Today we had a couple from the University of Nairobi and one uh, Waidaka from uh, KCA University uh, because yes, and that's how we've, uh, because the youth uh, have been left out in this conversation, but they are very woke you know, about the environment, about a lot of topical issues. And we think uh, because our schools uh, probably don't include these, our journalism schools, it's good for them to be exposed uh, to such programs. And we hope, uh, I know hope is there, we hope, uh, and as well as uh, Winnie and, and Waidaka, we hope that you'll be our ambassadors in the universities, uh, you know, to spend this message and to also look into specializing into telling stories of science, health and climate change once uh, you know you join us on this other side. Um, I beg to stop it here and let you uh, go enjoy your evenings with your loved ones. And thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, for this very important webinar talking about the politics of climate change, which was indeed you know uh, just a, a way bringing you in and we delved deeper uh, from our expert um, panelists. We've talked a lot of various things uh, from journalism uh, with Joyce Chimbi uh, to Dr. Frida Karani, a university lecturer uh, and somebody who is very passionate about climate change, as well as Dr. Jackson Kinyanjui, who at the age of, I think 33 has really studied a lot uh, into things to do with science and climate change and environment uh, to Mr. Maurice Kavai uh, from the Nairobi County. We appreciate you very much, as well as all of you participants for making time uh, to join us in this webinar. Kindly uh, be checking our Earth Journalism Net website. If you're a journalist, you can become a member. Uh, just go to the website, you'll see easy uh, ways to, 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 to join and you'll be receiving a lot of opportunities and resources from us like this webinar and a lot of story grants that we give and be on the lookout uh, for that pre-COP conference that we are organizing with the Rwanda Media Commission uh, to be held in Kigali, Rwanda. But it will bring um, you know, uh, reporters from Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and of course, Rwanda. Uh, from me and from Italy's as journalism network, it's Kwaheri. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>